Well, thank you, Anton and Ricky and Ben, for preparing and then leading us in worship today. What a great way to start our day off together as a church family. Well, today, of course, is Father's Day. And um, let me also add my Happy Father's Day greetings to all of you, especially to you dads out there. Hope you remi- remember to wish your dad a Happy Father's Day. Uh, it's a great blessing in my life to still have my dad in my life. And beyond that, to be uh, grateful forever that through his love and example, uh, I can learn to trust the love of my Heavenly Father. And I hope that's true for you as well. But it's not only Father's Day. This is also the end of, uh, tail end of what we could call graduation season here in our culture. Uh, Starting in May, thousands upon thousands of high schools and colleges, colleges all across the nation have celebrated with pomp and circumstance the, the, the celebration that we call graduation. Um, And I wonder today how many we have here in the service who just graduated from either high school or college. If you just graduated, raise your hand. Anybody? Congratulations. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. I suspect many others were actually went to a graduation. How many of you attended a graduation this year? Okay. I won't congratulate you because you just attended. How many went to a graduation party? Anybody? Oh, yeah. Graduation parties, you know, where they grill out and meet. An eggplant. I don't know what Jeff's talking about, grilled out eggplant. But most of us would agree that graduating from, with a degree, high school, college, grad school, doctorate, is a good thing. It's a good thing. It's a great accomplishment. But we would also assume that getting a degree is not the end goal. It's, it's a step to a greater goal. You know, paying off college debt is one thing, but getting a good job, actually doing something with the degree, but not so for a guy I read about in a story this week. I wonder if you saw the story. The guy's name is Michael Nicholson. He's from Kalamazoo, Michigan. Mr. Nicholson is 71 years old, and to date, he has earned, listen to this, one bachelor's degree, two associate degrees, 23 master's degrees, three specialist degrees, and one doctoral degree for a grand total of 30 degrees, which, of course, makes him a graduate of the class of 1963, 67, 69, 70, 74, 75, 77, 78, 80. You get the picture. Uh, He has degrees in educational leadership, library science, school psychology, home economics, health education, and law enforcement. He even has several seminary degrees. But here's the thing, he doesn't have and never has had a job related to any one of the fields he studied. Here's how he explains it himself in his own words, quote, I just stayed in school and took menial jobs to pay for the education and just made a point of getting more and more degrees. Eventually I retired so I could go full time to school. (laughs) One of his professors said this, he likes going to school. He just doesn't like responsibility. (laughs) Now, I'm all for education. I've been to school many, many years myself. But there's something just a bit sad or off, weird maybe, about a guy with 30 college degrees who's done nothing with those degrees. Now, today we're going to see that the Bible tells us it's possible to do the same thing with our faith. We're in the second week uh, of a series that we're calling Street Level Faith. It's from the New Testament book of James. And last week, Pastor Jeff told us that the book of James is actually an ancient letter written in about 45 or 50 A.D., uh, so a long time ago, just a decade or so after the death and resurrection of Jesus, uh, so very early in the story of the church, written by a guy named James who Jeff told us is most likely the half-brother of Jesus our Lord. That is, he was born to Mary and Joseph after Jesus when they had other children. And Jeff talked to us about uh, how we might want to try to understand how difficult it would be for James, the younger half-brother, to come to faith, meaning he had to believe that his older half-brother was actually the Son of God. Now you talk about taking sibling rivalry to a whole nother level. Now after coming to faith in Jesus, which James eventually did following the resurrection, he became the lead pastor, the shepherd of the flock, the church in Jerusalem during a very dangerous and chaotic time. Uh, Historians tell us that Jewish Christians around that time, around the area of Jerusalem, were fleeing uh, from the intense persecution that erupted following the martyrdom of Stephen. We read about that in the book of Acts. And James is very concerned 
about these young brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, he's concerned not so much about doctrine and theology. He assumes that the readers of his letter uh, understand the gospel. He assumes that they've put their faith in Jesus, but he's very concerned about what their faith looks like in the world, in real life at the street level. He's not so much concerned with what faith is, with what they believe. He's much more concerned about what faith does, how they actually live. Now, last week we began by looking at the first part of chapter 1. And we saw that James was concerned that these Jewish background followers of Christ were allowing their trials, their sufferings, to distort uh, what they thought about God. That they were, remember Jeff had the binoculars and he turned them around, that they were, they were looking at life and faith through the wrong lens. They were looking at God through the lens of their suffering rather than looking at their situation through the lens of of their loving Heavenly Father. He reminds them that it's not our trials that, understand our, that, that shape our understanding of God, rather it's our God who shapes our understanding of our trials. Today we pick it up in chapter 1, in verse 19. You can look on the screen up behind me or in your own Bible. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, beginning in verse 19. James writes, Know this, my beloved brothers. Now notice, James is pretty direct. You'll see this throughout the summer. He's, he's quite blunt sometimes. But he's not unloving. Uh, he's a loving pastor. He cares about his flock. My beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like the man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forget what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless." Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Okay, the first thing I see here that James tells us today is be hearers of the word. He wants his readers to know what it means to be hearers of the word. Now, every now and then in our house, probably somewhat more often than I would like to admit, um, usually when I'm watching uh, something important on TV like a Cubs game or some sporting event, the following scene will take place, something like this. I'll be sitting on the couch in our family room watching our, uh, focused on our TV, I mean focused on whatever game I'm watching because, you know, you have to be focused because your team needs you, right guys? <laughs> you have to be investing your energy, so I'm focused. Um, and my wife, uh, who is in the kitchen maybe, and she's just 15 feet away from where I'm sitting, and uh, she will say something to me, like, um, do you mind, you mind helping set up the table, or have you heard from one of the boys today? And this is what I actually hear. Wah, 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 <laughs> wah, wah. Like Charlie Brown's teacher, you know, in Charlie Brown. My, I hear sounds. And I'm vaguely aware there's another human being speaking to me, making those sounds, but I don't actually hear words. I don't hear because I'm focused on something else. I don't hear because I'm paying attention to other voices. I don't hear because I'm not listening. Again, verse 19. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now, a couple of questions. What was going on that James needs to write this? By the way, when you're reading the Bible, particularly the New Testament, most of which are letters written to real people in real time, ask yourself the question, why is the author needing to say this? Because he's writing to real people living in real circumstances, so try to figure out what the circumstance was, because it helps make sense what's being said. Now, being quick to hear and slow to anger is pretty good advice in any relationship. 
so often we fail to really hear and understand the other person. Maybe it's our spouse, maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a neighbor or a friend. And we fail to hear because we're, as soon as they begin to speak, we're feverishly beginning to, to figure out what we want to say next, right? I have a, an acquaintance, not somebody here in church, but an acquaintance who I will see uh, maybe uh, weekly or so. And it goes the same way every time basic greeting, and then he'll ask me a question, and I'll begin to answer. And I fall into the trap every time. I actually begin to answer like he's listening. Three words into what I say, he starts talking. Because I reminded him already of something he wants to say. So I'm, I'm not even through with my first sentence yet. Oh, I remember the time when he, it's just so annoying. And then I realize that I can often do the same thing. Because when whoever I'm talking to is talk, while they're talking, I'm thinking about what I want to say next, not trying to understand what they are saying. We maybe see this most when we're in conflict with someone, maybe in marriage. You know, we get frustrated or angry and we begin making an argument instead of listening. Um, we see it in our wider culture. We see it in social media, people from different viewpoints shouting at each other without stopping to listen to each other. And most of us have a tendency to do the opposite of what James is saying. Most of us are quick to anger, quick to listen, uh, quick to speak, and slow to listen. I don't think James is talking about marriage here, primarily. I don't think he's talking about political opinions here. I think James is talking about spiritual life here. I think he's concerned about his reader's relationship with God. Now remember the situation. We know that these early Jewish Christians, Jewish background Christians, uh, were facing trials. They've seen Stephen stoned to death right in front of their eyes. They've been driven from their homes by those who want to do the same thing to them. Many have lost their homes, lost their livelihoods. They're living in other towns and other regions as refugees. So we can assume that at least some of them are confused. Some of them are struggling. James has already encouraged them to try to understand their trials through the lens of faith. He's already encouraged them to ask for wisdom earlier in chapter 1. He's warned them that trials, sufferings, have a way of causing doubt and temptation to rise in our hearts and minds, distorting our understanding of God's goodness. So we can assume that some are actually struggling with that, with doubt, with temptation. Some are starting to believe that God has abandoned them, that he doesn't care about them anymore. Maybe some are wanting to respond to their situation with anger or retribution or violence. They want to fight back in revenge. So James is concerned that they've stopped listening, that they've stopped hearing, that they've stopped paying attention to the voice of the Holy Spirit through God's Word. Just this past week, I had a conversation with a man who told me that there was a certain point in his life, he was a Christian, had his, put his faith in Jesus, but at a certain point in his life, a series of devastating personal disappointments caused him to react by becoming embittered toward God. And he consciously told God, I'm no longer listening to you. I no longer trust you. The phrase, be quick to hear, carries a sense of listening well. Listen to understand. Listen to learn. Now, I think James is talking about hearing, understanding, learning from the Word of God. Now, at that time, the Word of God would have been what we call the Old Testament, along with the teachings of Jesus himself were, that were being passed on orally through the apostles who were teaching the early church. Be quick to hear and listen to the wisdom of God. Be quick to listen to the teaching of people like James and Paul and others. James is saying, don't allow your situation, your frustration, your anger to keep you from the wisdom God wants to give you. Don't allow other voices, the voice of a hostile culture, for example, the voice of an enemy who seeks to deceive and lie and to discourage, don't let all the noise drown out the voice of the word. Now, I know it's entirely possible that James, through this ancient letter, is talking to somebody right here in this room. Because it's possible to come here to church today, but be thinking about a thousand different things. 
thinking about work, about finances, about a child under distress or the stress of your own life or some pain in your life. And you're thinking about a thousand different things and it's hard for you to focus and concentrate and hear anything other than the clutter and the noise and the chatter going on in your own head. So James is saying, stop, slow down, and listen. Hear, because God has something to say to you today. He has wisdom to share with you today. He says, be hearers of the word first. Secondly, he tells us, be receivers of the word. Be receivers of the word. When I was in 10th or 11th grade, sophomore, junior high school, somewhere around in there, I had to take a class called trigonometry. Anybody remember trig from high school days? Can any of you actually say you enjoyed trigonometry? I don't believe you. <laughs> now you have to understand at that point, I wasn't, a terribly, I wasn't terribly serious about my academic life. My basic philosophy, and I'm, I'm, this is, I'm not a good example here. In high school, my basic philosophy was do as little as possible, just make sure you get a B. And that's not the best way to go through it, but that's what I did. Uh, on top of that, I didn't particularly enjoy math. Well, that's, that's, that's not true. I hated math <laughs> with a passion. Uh, I just, I, I couldn't figure out what it was good for. I mean, once I had learned how to figure out my batting average, <laughs> my shooting percentage, I mean, what else did you need, right, in all of life? What else did you need? I didn't see the need for stuff like geometry, trigonometry, but it was required, so there I was, trigonometry class. After several weeks, I was, I was getting a pretty solid D in trigonometry. And my teacher, who was a rather odd man uh, named Mr. McCaffrey, he called me in for a conference during school. A conference. Now, I knew I wasn't, I wasn't doing so hot in class, but a conference, that was like way over the top, you know. So I was planning, okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to nod my head, yes sir, yes sir, promise to do better, promise to do my homework, all that sort of stuff. But unbeknownst to me, Mr. McCaffrey had also invited to join the conference my football coach, a man I feared and respected at the same time named Coach Gennaro. Coach Jay, I called him. He's still a friend in my life, but uh, in those days, I was terrified. But he invited him to come to this meeting. So when I walked into this meeting and I see my football coach sitting there, I immediately began to tremble and sweat because I knew I was in trouble. Now, Mr. McCaffrey didn't scare me, but Coach Jay terrified me. So Mr. McCaffrey laid out my grades right in front of my coach, put them right out there on the table. And he, here's what he said. I still remember word for word. He said, Coach, he was no longer talking to me. He was talking to my coach. He said, Coach, the thing I don't understand is how a student like this can put so much energy and discipline into football and so little effort into his classwork. I'm looking down. <laughs> And I said, my coach looked at me, I mean, burned holes in my soul with his beady eyes. And he said, son, looks like we have a problem with motivation. <laughs> and that was true. I was resistant to the word Mr. McCaffrey wanted to implant in me. And my coach proceeded to motivate me all the way up to, I think, a C plus by the end of the semester. Verse 21, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. What does it mean to receive the implanted word? Well, first it means to put away other things. Put away filthiness and rampant wickedness. That means sin and disobedience. Now, he's not saying here we need to clean our act up before God offers his grace. That's not true. That's not the gospel. But he is saying the word cannot take root and grow deeply in our lives when our hearts are cluttered or hardened by sin. I think James might be thinking about what his older half-brother Jesus taught in a story called the parable of the soils. In Matthew 13, Jesus tells a story about a farmer who went to sow seed. Some seed fell on hardened soil and the birds came and snatched it away. Some seed fell on rocky soil and it failed, failed to take root. Other seed fell on what he calls thorny soil and it began to grow and then weeds grew up around it and choked it out. But some seed fell on good soil and it grew and produced a harvest. Now the soils represent the condition of our hearts and the seed represents the gospel. 
what James calls the implanted word that can save your soul. Now, I think we have this tendency, particularly in, in the quote-unquote evangelical church, to reduce the gospel to believe in Jesus and go to heaven when you die. Believe in Jesus and go to heaven when you die. And of course, that's true, but it's not all the gospel does. The gospel does far, far more. The gospel, when received by faith, gives us a new heart through the forgiveness of sin and a new destiny that's eternal life. So the, heart, the, the gospel does give us those things. Believe in Jesus, go to heaven when you die. But also, even deeper than that, the gospel gives us new identity. The New Testament tells us we've been adopted as sons and daughters, no longer defined by our culture, no longer defined by our education, by even our families or our failures or our past. We're now defined by the love and transformation and redemption of Christ himself. You have a new identity, and we have new purpose. There's no longer living for ourselves, but rather we're living to serve Christ and his kingdom that is made manifest through the church. A pastor named Jared Wilson has written a book called Gospel Deeps in which he says, we like that our gospel gets our sins forgiven and gives us a ticket to heaven, but we're not sure of its functionality in our lives every day. That's what James is talking about. James is saying, when you receive the implanted word, when the gospel takes root in your life, it gives you a new life. Jesus summarized the gospel by saying you must be born again. And at the street level, at the level where we live every day, it means being given a second chance to live a different kind of life. A life lived from a different identity for a different purpose. Now notice, none of this has anything to do with the circumstances of our lives, with what's happening around us. It has all to do with what God has already done within us. James is reminding them these early Jewish background Christians, of who they are. And then he's challenging them to live out of that new identity, a new life. Which leads us to the third thing he says here, be doers of the word. Be hearers of the word, be receivers of the word, and be doers of the word. A while back I heard someone describe uh, the difference between men and women. You know, I, there are differences. Um, by observing what happens when each looks into a mirror. Women have been taught by our culture to look into a mirror and to see all the myriad flaws that the mirror shows. You know, complexion, um, color of skin, uh, eyelashes, all that kind of stuff. And then they have a whole bunch of products designed to address the perceived imperfections, which is why God invented two sink bathrooms, right? Um, <laughs> A man rolls out of bed, stumbles into the bathroom, picks up his toothbrush, looks in the mirror and goes, looking good. <laughs> Just one of the little differences. But I think there's something true, spiritually speaking, about both approaches to a mirror. Now the purpose of a mirror is to allow us to see ourselves as we are. But the truth is we often see a somewhat distorted image kind of like those funhouse mirrors, right? Remember the funhouse mirrors? You go stand in front of one, it makes you look really, really tall. You go in front of another one, it makes you look almost round like a beach ball. Uh, I saw a study recently that says that this is how people see themselves. Uh, it said that on a surveys, like these surveys you take about, you know, human behavior and so forth, that most people tend to misrepresent themselves on those surveys. When asked, for example, if they exercise regularly, Almost everyone will report that they go to the gym about twice as often as they actually do. It's just what we do, right? Same thing happens when you're asked how much you give to charitable causes or how often we attend worship. In other words, we mostly will fudge just a bit on the positive side to make ourselves appear a little more diligent, a little more generous than we actually are. Like 95% of people say they're above average, right? That, that's the way we do it. So the mirror we use to see ourselves is warped just a bit. So James encourages here, us here to look in a different kind of mirror. Verse 22, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Okay, what's he saying here? I think James is telling us that the gospel <clears throat> is a kind of spiritual mirror 
in which we can see ourselves as God sees us. And so how does God see us? Now, right now, my guess is most of you are immediately thinking something like this. Well, God must see me as a flawed and sinful creature because he sees all my failures. So he wants me to see that too. He wants me to see how far I am from the ideal he wants for me, how far I fall short. No, I don't think that's what James is saying at all. I think he's saying the exact opposite of that. Think about the gospel for a moment, what I just went through. The gospel is the good news that in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone, the Bible says, the new has come. So if I put on the gospel mirror, this is actually one of the ones my mother used to have. How does this work? Oops. Remember these? My mom used to have one of these. Okay, so if you put on the gospel mirror, what do you see? Jeff had his binoculars, I have my neck mirror, okay? <laughs> the gospel is the good news that in Christ you're a new creation. The gospel mirror tells us that we have received a new heart through the forgiveness of sins. Our sins, past, present, future, all wiped away, made clean. We have new identity. We are adopted as his children. We've been given new purpose and new destiny. Jesus, James is saying, you don't have to pretend to be better than you are. You don't have to pretend about anything, nor do you have to see yourself in light of your own past and failures. See yourself as God now sees you through the mirror of the gospel. Verse 20, uh, 25, chapter 1. But, this, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. What does James mean by the perfect law? By the law of liberty. Now he's writing to Jewish background believers in Christ. These people knew what the law was. In Jewish life, the law was the Torah, the Ten Commandments, all the rules for holy living. But that's not what James is talking about. He's talking about a different law, the law of liberty. In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul writes, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. You see it? The law of liberty in James is the law of the Spirit of life in Paul. That is, in Christ we are set free from the mirror of our sin of our past, of our failures. We are set free from condemnation. We are set free from uh, the, the slavery to our circumstances. We are set free to see ourselves differently, to see ourselves as who we are in Christ, and therefore set free to live differently as well. Notice, then James writes this, verse 26. If anyone thinks he is religious, it does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart. This person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. I think this is the only place in the New Testament where the words religion and religious are used in this way. Primarily, that's because Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. But putting that aside... By religion, James means the kind of religion that is practiced in outward rituals, but which fails to change the heart, fails to impact the way people actually live. What he's saying is that any religion that fails to produce a changed life is worthless because it has failed to reach the heart of the person who practices it. And such religion is worthless, he's saying. Now James wraps up this section of the letter by giving us three examples of what being a doer of the word looks like. First he says speech, how we talk. We'll talk much more about this in a couple of weeks. He says if anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. Our words matter. How we speak matters. Second, compassion. Verse 27, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. He's saying to us, compassion matters. Caring matters. 
That's why Chapel Street's involved with ministries like Naomi's house. Women are being rescued from the sex slave industry. Lazarus house. Royal Family Kids Camp, which just got finished last week. A Shepherd's Heart, Buddy Briggs. Why we're involved in those things? Because our service, our compassion, is our currency in the world. What we say is worthless without compassion. Our compassion makes our words credible to the world. Thirdly, he says purity. To keep oneself unstained from the world. That means to refuse to be polluted That's the word literally polluted by the world, meaning our behavior matters. Our behavior matters. Here's how we say it at Chapel Street. And I think James would like this. We say, we want people to experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact right where you are. We want people to experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact right where you are where you are. We want people to hear the word, receive the word, and become doers of the word. I like to say that truth shows up in unexpected places. It does. Movies, for example. I believe most of the movies that we come to love, whether it be Gone with the Wind or Star Wars, or The Wizard of Oz, or Terminator, one, two, three, or four. Most of the movies that move us are in some way a reflection of the great story. Most of the stories that touch us and move us are reflections, shadows of the one great story that the Bible tells, the story of redemption, the story of sacrificial love. And so it is with one of our family favorites, Lion King. Do you know Lion King came out as a movie in 1994? Wow. Now it's a musical. It's the uh, second, excuse me, uh, third longest running Broadway musical of all time and the top grossing Broadway musical of all time. Amazing. It's the story of Simba, as most of you know, who's the son of Mufasa the king. But Mufasa dies in an accident uh, orchestrated by jealous and evil Uncle Scar, and Simba thinks it's all his fault. So Simba runs away, goes into hiding, runs from his destiny as the next king. He doesn't want to be king. He doesn't believe he's worthy to be king, so he hides from all of that. But then toward the end of the movie, Mufasa His father, who's dead, appears to him in a kind of vision or dream, and he takes him to a reflecting pool. And there he shows him his own reflection. And for the first time, Simba sees himself as Mufasa sees him. And Mufasa says to his son, you are more than what you have become. Remember who you are. It's truth. It shows up in funny places. I think that's what James is trying to tell the early church. Look in the mirror of the gospel. Remember who you are. And I think that's what he's trying to say to us. Remember who you are. Be hearers, receivers, and doers of the word. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for this powerful reminder that we are called to be hearers, but not hearers only, receivers, but not receivers only, but doers of your word. And that all that we do flows from what you have already done in and for us. And we give you our thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Amen.